the free market. It's a loaded and misunderstood term. At its very core, a free market is one in which any willing buyer and any willing seller are able to exchange goods and services without interference from a third party. In a free market, each individual gets to be the ultimate sovereign of his person and property. On the opposite end of the market sovereignty spectrum, from an absolute free market, is a command economy where a government dictates the bounds of legitimate economic activity and punishes any behavior outside of those bounds with state violence. Most humans operate inside markets which are somewhere between the free market and a command economy. No individual has all of the information necessary to meet the needs of every other individual. However, each individual has specific knowledge about his own needs. In a free market, individuals are able to interact without impediment, communicating their subjective demands and their ability to fulfill those demands via supply of labor and goods. The less friction involved in this meeting of the minds, the faster information can spread and the faster the needs of humanity can be met. The free market promises to be an engine of human flourishing. But from the beginning, there have been trade-offs and challenges. The first economies were completely free. Each of our primitive ancestors were able to make use of any property they could defend. That defense came at significant risk, however, and the cost of accumulation of wealth far outweighed the benefits that could be expected from possession of that wealth. As the age of great chiefs and kings gained momentum and the first civilizations emerged, one of the primary roles of powerful sovereigns, the wealthiest members of society, was to settle property disputes. The Code of Hammurabi, the rules laid down by an ancient king of Babylon and often cited as a precursor of our own modern legal system, is primarily concerned with economic fairness and reciprocity expressed as a particular focus on person and property. The technology for economic exchange from the time of Hammurabi until the revelation of Satoshi has been inadequate for dispute resolution. The people throughout history have cried out for fairness, claiming that the market was too free and that those with economic clout were taking advantage of the less fortunate. In tragic but frequent periods throughout history, demagogues and the unscrupulous have seized upon those cries and rode them to authoritarian dictatorships brutal command economies that were, ironically, the pinnacle of unfairness and brutality. Bitcoin is a revolution in value transfer, an economic tool that mitigates issues with the free market that have existed since antiquity. In the first sentence of the Bitcoin white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto illuminates his work. He writes, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Later, in the introduction to the white paper, Satoshi makes clear the weakness of a system which relies on a trusted third party, such as a bank, to effectuate transactions. Such a financial institution, he says, cannot avoid mediating disputes. In the course of such mediation, transactions can be reversed, censored by the adjudicating financial institution. The final judge, in all cases, is the sovereign. In the system before Bitcoin, then, the market could only be as free as the sovereign was ethical. If the banks and governments are corrupt, then the people are under the yoke of a command economy. Well, are the banks and governments corrupt? Lord Acton's famous statement on the matter, written in 1887, is the touchstone. He wrote, Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and not authority. Still more when you super add the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. The mere authority to censor financial transactions, if we believe Acton, ensures the corruption of the financial system itself. Therefore, no command economy can ever deliver fairness because only a free market, where no one but willing buyer and seller are involved in a transaction, can sustain itself uncorrupted. It does not matter whether the authority for determining what you can do with your labor and the fruits of that labor is vested in a king, a bank manager, or the votes of your neighbors. 
Without a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash, the financial foundation of a global digital economy will be rotten at its core. The promise of Bitcoin is that it allows uncensorable transfer of unconfiscatable value. This is made possible through harnessing consciousness itself, mathematical rules that have laid dormant since the beginning of time, waiting to be discovered by a species with an intelligence sufficiently advanced enough to make use of such abstract tools. To embrace Bitcoin, to truly embrace Bitcoin and the promise it presents is to accept the notion that so long as he uses neither force nor fraud, your neighbor is a better judge of what he should do with his person and property than are you. In the case of those who expend energy to hash and create blocks, Satoshi writes in the white paper that such an individual ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules, such rules that favor him with more new coins than everyone else combined, than to undermine the system and the validity of his own wealth. Unless there is evidence otherwise, and certain individuals have stated that they desired to use their hash to destroy the value of networks, the goal of a Bitcoin miner is to both gain more new coins and increase the overall market value of those coins. He does so in competition with other miners as he wants to accrue more coins than everyone else. But he takes his actions in cooperation with every other market participant. If the overall value of a network increases due to minor actions, then every existing network participant benefits. Therefore, the only individuals who are incentivized to discourage majority hash from acting in a manner that it sincerely believes will increase the value of a Bitcoin network are those who benefit from the failure of the particular network in question. As Lord Acton states, exercising influence as a means to act as an authority over the benign action of others is the path to corruption, if not the signal of corruption itself. I've dedicated my life and reputation to the furtherance of Bitcoin because I believe that you, and not anyone else, should be the sovereign of your person and your property. I want to play a role in expanding human flourishing by increasing the web of mutual self-interest that commerce creates. Bitcoin gives us the most powerful framework yet for building this new world. If we live by principle, seeking to deliver full financial sovereignty to everyone, then we truly do have a chance to pass on a more peaceful and prosperous world to our descendants.